this marks the first and hopefully what will be a series of live streams where I talk about the concept of God and then I filter what I'm talking about through the lens of the grammar technology known as correct sentence structure communication parse syntax grammar the grammar technology brought to the public in 1988 by the late Colin David Eifenwin Colin Miller. What it is basically is a mathematical interface on grammar. If you want more closure on what that grammar is, you're more than welcome to peruse my TikTok channel here, uh, Cosmosity, and you're more than welcome to go over to my main channel, which is my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash Jason Matthew Glass. You can find a link to that in my bio. And there are almost 900 videos over there giving closure to this technology, also known as quantum grammar. <clears throat> For those of you out there who are actually serious about this grammar, like you want to learn it, you want to commit to learning it, Again, you can go to my bio and you can find my email address there, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. Send me an email. Please include your full correct name and apply for a workshop because I provide a, a full curriculum that will take you from point A to point Z in learning this grammar if you want to. And I've been teaching it since February of 2018 to hundreds of people, hundreds of students all over the earth. But I will say that only a very, very, very small percentage of those students actually had the tenacity to commit to getting closure on the grammar and actually being successful with using it. Because that's important too. You commit to learning it, you get closure on it, then you use it, then you're successful with it. But you have to stick with it. So now that I've got that spiel out of the way, as I first mentioned, this is my volition is to create a series of live streams on TikTok and then you know, republishing them over on YouTube, talking about the concept of God and then looking at those concepts through the lens of correct sentence structure communication, parse, syntax, grammar. I feel like now is the correct. Uh, now space location to do this simply because of the comments I get from people who mention these words like God, Satan, you know, demons, angels, these types of things. So for the dilettante out there, for the Individuals just curious about this, this may be very interesting for you. For those of you who have very, very, very strong and severe religious or spiritual beliefs, this might be a little challenging for you. And for those of you who are serious about the grammar and have certain spiritual religious beliefs, this is probably this series will probably be critical to you getting closure on the grammar or not. So that I've stated my volition. This is my looks like my 20th live stream on TikTok. I have to keep producing these in order to keep using the studio. And I figured this would be a good topic because I see a lot of this stuff on TikTok. So let's start off with trying to narrow down what we mean in general what most people mean when they use the word God so it says here polytheistic thought a God is a spirit or being believed to control some part of the universe or life and often worshipped for doing so or something that represents this spirit or being. Belief in the existence of at least one God is called theism. Views regarding God vary considerably. Many notable theologi 
theologians, sorry, and philosophers have developed arguments for and against the existence of God. Atheism rejects the belief in any deity. Agnosticism is the belief that the existence of God is unknown or unknowable. Some theists view knowledge concerning God as derived from faith. God is often conceived as the greatest entity in existence. Okay. So this is basically what most people think of in general when they think of what God is. Definition of God. Oh wow. This is G-A-D. Gad. That's like a Michigan accent. That's pretty funny. Okay, so the first in our line of definitions is in parentheses in Christianity and other monotheistic religions the creator and ruler of the universe and source of all moral authority the supreme being and the second one a superhuman being or spirit worshipped as having power over nature or human forces a deity so let's go and look at a couple more of these things here what is the correct definition of God <laughs> Number one, God, the supreme or ultimate reality, such as the being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness, who is worshipped, as in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, as creator and ruler of the universe throughout the patristic and medieval periods. Uh, what is the biblical definition of God? God in Christianity is believed to be the eternal supreme being who created and preserves all things. That's interesting that under the heading of what is the biblical definition of God, Christianity's definition comes first. If you're a fan of history as I am, uh, in the way that I, you know, I know, I know that history itself cannot be certified. You either believe it or you think it's possible or probable, but there is really no way you can prove it unless you are actually physically there witnessing it. So a lot of times what we look at is history, we're using assumption presumption. There's no way around it. And so from the current method of dating, meaning placing on a timeline certain religious texts, documents, manuscripts, uh, scrolls, papyrus, so on and so forth. As far as monotheistic religions go, Judaism is the first. That is the root. The first five books of the Bible, uh, first book written in what, Hebrew, one of the oldest written, known written languages, not the oldest, but one of the oldest known, uh, and out of that, out of Judaism, came Christianity, and then after that came Islam. And there's a whole story as to what's going on behind that. Uh, history, as we say, his story, again, can't really certify it. So it's interesting that they put Christianity first. What did the word God originally mean? God turned out to be a noun derived from a past participle with the sense one invoked. This is an old hypothesis. Both Walter W. Skeet, the author of still the most authoritative etymological dictionary of English. Hey. I have to check that out. All right, so... What is the root of the word God? Why do they call God God? Among ancient Israel's neighbors, what? Did, okay, in light of the current events and things like that, what do they mean by ancient Israel? Because Israel has only existed literally as a nation or as an entity, a condition of state, as in an entity like Russia. Vatican City, 
Washington, D.C., United States, so on and so forth. It's only existed in that same context since the end of World War II. Before that, there was no maps that had the word Israel on them prior to the 1940s. It was always called Palestine. So I don't know what they mean by ancient Israel unless they are referring to the stories from the Bible and things like that. People refer to the most powerful god as El, which is not actually a name, but an ancient Semite title. Chief deity of all the other gods, the god. Okay. And we get into a bunch of Jesus stuff here, which is, which is cool. So as you can see, there really isn't any concrete closure on what this is. It's always talking about a belief, believed to be, some people think, blah, 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 blah. It's not concrete. Let's try... What is wind? Wind is simply air in motion. So air, wind is something that you can't really see. You can feel it though. And you can certify it to someone else. So it doesn't say wind is believed to be air in motion. It says it is there in motion. So there's no doubt. There's no belief asked in the same way that is used in uh, what they say about God. How about heat? You can't really see heat either. The quality of being hot. High temperature. It doesn't say the belief of the quality of being hot. It says the quality of being hot. Okay? Do you, do you see what I'm getting at here, folks? How about this? What is love? Love is a set of emotions and behaviors characterized by intimacy, passion, and commitment. Okay. It doesn't say love is believed to be a set of emotions and behaviors. It says it is. So that's another thing. You can't see love, but you can feel it. So those of you out there who say, you know, when you try to prove God, the concept of God, say, well, you can't see God, but you can feel. Well, no, not really. I mean, people say, well, God is love. Well, no, with correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, love is love and God is God. It's one word, one meaning. So that doesn't work. So now I'm going to bring it back to the grammar here. What do we know about history, folks? What do we know about written history? Who writes the history books? Now, if you go back through said history books, most times you will find the oldest writings, the oldest quote-unquote, historical writings were usually written by the most educated segment of society. And in ancient times, that most often was the priest segment. You get it? The higher caste, the monks, the priests the ones who basically controlled everything. Because as you probably know, or can at least surmise, religion and religious systems have been used to control humanity since time immemorial. The proof of that still exists to this day. But that's something to talk about on down the line. Right now I'm talking about 
history and the recording and logging of such. So we can safely say that most of the preserved historical writings, the vast majority of them, I would say 99% of them, were written by the most educated segment in society, which back then was the priesthood, the monks, the religious, spiritual uh, guides that society looked up to, society gave sacrifices to, paid their taxes to, whatever it was. So they controlled the narrative of what was being shared with the public. Are you with me? And this goes right into the old saying, history is written by the winners. So if you really believe that, if it logically makes sense, which to me it does, it makes sense. History is written by the winners. The winners can modify and change history as much as they want to. If something was written 600 years ago or 1,000 years ago and it's preserved, how do we know what actually happened? All we have are words on paper. Are we going to just trust that the author was being 100% above board and honest about what they witnessed? Or if they have a particular political bias or a particular stake in controlling the public using religion, well, aren't they going to craft their history in accordance with that bias? Do you see what I'm saying? That's why I say, and I may be getting ahead of myself, that is why I say religion, and specifically the writings of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, is the most successful psyop ever perpetrated upon mankind. The most successful control mechanism. Hopefully by the end of this series you will see why. So now we've established a couple premises. Number one, the majority of preserved historical documents were written by priests and monks, i.e. the religious sector of society, which at one time was usually the most educated sector of society. Number two, history is written by the winners, by the controllers. So they can mold it however they want to. So now we've established those things. Now you can look at everything, all the documents, everything that's been written, shared, preserved, studied, blah, 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 argued about through the lens of those two things. That most of history was written by the priest caste, the priesthood, the monks, the religious controllers. And number two, history is written by the winners. Really, I could end this video series right there and I would tell you all you need to know about religious beliefs as far as what's written down and what's preserved and what's claimed. But I digress. We are not going to stop there. We're going to keep going and I'm going to gradually uh, add more and more evidence to this for you to study. So now uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to bring it around to correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, because the creator, well, stop and correct. The publisher of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, the late Colin David Eifenwin, Colin Miller, he used to talk about God and belief in God. And for the most part, I agreed with his viewpoints on that, except for the viewpoint of believing in a God in and of itself. So let's get into that right now. I'm going to go back over to the website. I don't really know who runs this particular website. It may have actually been David himself back in the day. But I just did a search on the Lord's Prayer and then I put David Winmiller's name next to it. 
and this is one of the results that came up. So I'm going to guess that most, if not all, of the people watching this right now on TikTok during the live stream don't know the first thing about correct sentence structure. So let's look at the grammar here. Using the balance of the honor and the grace. You see here a full colon and then the word knowledge. And then a space. And then an equal sign. And then a space. Now we can forgive that. Uh, with correct sentence structure, there would be no space between the E and the equal sign. But we can forgive that. So we have for the knowledge equals for the learning. ING is a modifier. There is no modification in correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. So this is not correct. The learning of the difference. In order to use the particle DI, you would have to put a hyphen between the I and the F because a lot of times it is in, in itself a particle of negation when used like that. Between. Okay, BE is a particle of negation. But that's the most, that is not the important thing here. You see this word between the truth and lie. For the learning of the difference between the truth and lie. In correct sentence structure, FOR is what is known as a positional. THE is a lodial. Learn would be a fact. Of would be a positional. THE would be a lodial. Difference would be the fact. Theoretically. This is not correct, but I'm talking, you know, educational and entertainment purposes only. So now we have between the truth. So in the concatenation, between would have to be a positional. But in correct sentence structure, there are four positionals. Four of, with, and by. Only four. Between is not a positional. And the reason why is because in correct sentence structure, it's one word, one meaning, one function, one congruency. The function of the positional for is for the cause of the sentence. The function of the positional of is with the concern of the sentence or the consequence of the fact. I'm sorry, of the fact. For is the cause of the fact or the claim. Of is the concern or consequence of the cause or of a possessive. With is possessive. By is authority. For is congruent with by. Of is congruent with with. When you think of the mathematical equation 1 plus 2 equals 3 and then you check it going backwards 3 minus 2 equals 1 the important things to note are the plus and the minus plus is congruent with minus correct sentence structure works the same way 4 is congruent with by of is congruent with with 4 is cause of is concern with is possessive by is authority between does not fit in there because now you have to come up with another function because the cause is already taken, the concern is already taken, the possessive is already taken, the authority is already taken. So what's between? It has to have a function. And what is it congruent with? If plus is congruent with minus, multiplication is congruent with division, four is congruent with by, of is congruent with with, what would between be congruent with? See what I'm saying? That is why it is not correct. Good and evil, we have the uh, vowel in front of a consonant. That's no contract. Uh, jealousy and compassion. Persecution. Forgiveness. Four is a particle of negation. Lonesome and partnership. Lust and love. Happiness out of heaven and hell. Dunning and done. That's a new one. Anyways, particle of negation there. Ooh, all things. That's definitely a no-no. Because one 
that the whole thing about correct sentence structure is providing a continuance of the evidence. And how can you ever prove all? You really can't. Like the story that David Wynn Miller used to tell about the uh, the guy that he was advising that had a court case. I think it was a traffic accident, or I don't really remember what the subject matter of the case was. I just know that David said that his friend went into court and told the judge, "I can prove my case. I have all the evidence." And the judge said, "You have all the evidence." And the guy says, "Yeah." He says, okay, well, I want you to come back here next month at this time on this date and bring all the evidence with you. He's like, okay. So then the guy went to David and said, what am I going to do? How do I possibly bring all the evidence? And David told him to start practicing handstands. So then the time came a month later. The guy had to go back to court, and the judge said, okay. Show me all the evidence. And the guy, <laughs> in the well of the court, the guy uh, stood up on his hands and did a handstand. And then he said to the judge, Here I am, holding all the evidence in my hands with my feet dangling in a sea of space. I bring you all the evidence on planet Earth. And then, according to David, the judge was like, Okay, dismissed. But that's what, that's why you don't use all, or you would never use all in a correct sentence structure, because you can't prove all. So let's look at the grammar of this Lord's Prayer. This translation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For the people of the Father is with the creation by the Father. Whoa. So I'm thinking that David Windmiller translated this. Our Father who art in heaven, he translated to, for the people of the Father is with the creation by the Father. First of all, the verb in that would be Let's go to this. This is what we're looking at. For the Father of the people is with the creation by the Father. This verb would have to be plural R because... Hold on. That's not the correct translation. This is different. For the Father of the people is with the creation by the Father. For the people of the Father is with the creation by the Father. Why is that different? For the people of the Father are with the creation by the Father. That's what this should say, but it, they changed it. I see why they changed it. Because if you do it like this, for the people of the Father is with the creation by the Father, and you correct it, backwards it would have to be, for the Father of the creation is with the Father by the people, and it makes the people the authority of the Father. That's hilarious. But whoever wrote this website modified it so that the Father is the authority and the cause in that sentence. That's really funny, ladies and gentlemen. I never noticed that before. But what kind of a translation of our Father who art in heaven is that? I guess our being the people of the Father. So I guess I can, I can see that. But it doesn't really give... Okay, so in heaven, translation of that would be with the knowledge in the heaven is with the holy name of the Father. 
Now that is not correct because every correct sentence structure must start with for the. So let's take this and put it into a Word document so that I can give you a little grammar lesson here because it wouldn't be a grammar channel if I'm not doing grammar lessons. With the knowledge in the heaven is with the holy name of the Father. How would you write that backwards? Literally it would look like this. With the Father of the Holy Name is out the heaven of the knowledge. Because as I stated a little bit ago, of is congruent with with, for is congruent with by. So when you write it backwards, it becomes with the Father. Of the Holy Name. Singular is. It says in the heaven, so that what is congruent within? Out. So out the heaven with the knowledge. Of the knowledge. That makes absolutely no sense. Correct sentence structure must start with a cause. And the cause of the sentence is for. For the facts. For the fact of the fact is with the fact by the fact so when you read it backwards it says the same thing so you could actually fix this very easily For the knowledge of the heaven is with the holy name by the Father. For the Father of the holy name is with the heaven by the knowledge. But whose knowledge is it? See, it's still, I mean, while it's syntactically correct, it still doesn't really make any sense. It's starting to. Heaven is a location, so let's put a, a tilde there, even if it's an imaginary location or a theoretical location. So whose knowledge are we talking about? See, this is what I mean by when you get into things like this, that's why people argue about the Bible all the time. Because it's all conjecture. It's all interpretation. How do we translate this? Does knowledge have to be possessive? Well, whose knowledge is it? In correct sentence structure, one may only make a claim for oneself. Although you can't speak in generalities, um, like you, you could say, for the claimant's knowledge, of the facts is with the claim of the perception with the holy name of the Father with the location of the heaven with this conveyance by this claimant period so then you're conveying the same thing you're conveying that for whatever reason you're making this claim, you're claiming that heaven is a location, the name is holy, 
and it's the Father's holy name, but you're making the claim. You're not making a claim for anyone else but you. You have taken jurisdiction over that, and you have said it's your, percep your perception, which may not be my perception, or her perception, or whatever. So that's why you would have to direct whose knowledge it is. Because you can't make a claim for someone else. That would be trespassing. Unless they give you permission to do that. You may only make a claim for yourself. So that's why you would phrase it like that. That's not to say that you, you can't make a general statement. Like if you were to write a set of rules you could make it in general like uh, for the knowledge of the crime is with the data share of the witness with an authority by the claimant's consent or something like that, which would basically mean that if you have knowledge of a crime, then you have a duty to report it to an authority that you consent to so that that authority can rectify or, you know, right the wrong. That's just a general sense of a rule that you could make in general where the knowledge wouldn't really be possessed. It's, it's possessed by all those people that agree to those terms and conditions. But that would all have to be laid out beforehand, and if you're going to use correct sentence structure for that, then they would all have to be live life claimants. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through this whole thing because there is so much error in here. So, so much. So many mistakes. The point I'm making is we've established where historical writings come from. The majority of them. They come from the most educated people at the time that knew how to read and write, which in ancient times were the priests and the monks. The folks who taught people religion. I mean, how convenient for a certain group of people who believe in a Lord and Savior that that Lord and Savior just so happened to tell them Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto the Lord what is the Lord's. Meaning, pay your taxes, and also pay your church. Because who is the earthly representative of the God? The church, the priests, the Pope, whoever it is. That's pretty convenient, I think. If anybody has any questions out there, feel free to pop them in the chat. This is just sort of an introductory, an introduction to the series I'm going to be doing here with uh, God and Grammar. This is to give you an idea of the flavor that it's going to have. What I tried to convey at the beginning when I was looking up on Google, what is God, what is heat, what is love, what is wind, I was showing you how even in the fiction things are certified things exist but then when it comes time to looking up God that concept it suddenly becomes well it is the belief of this it is believed that that some people think it's this it's not a sure thing it's non-certifiable and with correct sentence structure you have to be able to certify your continuance of the evidence of the facts. You have to be able to prove things. Just like I can prove this is a cup. 
if you're going to be using the word God in a contract, you better be able to prove God the way I prove this cup. It's fine if you want to participate with those types of concepts in your own private, confidential biosphere with you and yourself. What is a fact for you is a fact for you. Your standards are your standards. But when you step outside of that and you try to contract with other contract parties and other live life claimants and you're going to start using words as facts and expect other people to participate with those facts, when they call you to the carpet to say, okay, what's this word? What's God? Prove that to me. And then if you can prove it to me, then we can use it as a fact and it's in our contract and I agree to those terms and conditions. But if you can't, we're either not going to contract or we're going to get rid of that word because it's not a fact. And that is the main point I'm making. If you're going to put a fact in your correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, contracts, you have to be able to prove it. You have to be able to give closure to it. You have to be able to provide a continuance of the evidence to other contract parties that that fact exists and functions as a fact. Either, either something's a fact or it's not a fact. I saw a video the other day, Jordan Peterson said that the Bible isn't just true, it's more than true. Which makes absolutely no sense to me because if you think about something, either something's true or it's not true. If it's more than true, then it means it's not true. If a fact is more than a fact, then it's not a fact. If it's less than a fact, it's not a fact. A fact is a fact. Truth is truth. So this ta these types of word games don't help anything. Let's put it that way. That's what I like about quantum grammar. It's straight, straightforward. No assumption, presumption. No imagination. It's all right there for you. The closure is there. And it's either up to you to accept it or not accept it. But it's there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like, and I'll do the same, and we'll see if this is something that uh, you're prepared to commit to. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.